from Washington, D.C. and around the world. This is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news trends and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm Mimi Gerges. A new pandemic preparedness plan from the NIH would pave the way for faster responses to emerging or re-emerging threats of infectious diseases. Dr. Anthony Fauci is director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and chief medical advisor to the president. Dr. Fauci, welcome to the program. Thank you, good to be with you. Did the government not have a pandemic preparedness plan before COVID-19? Why did it take two years after the start of a global pandemic? No, uh, that's a understandable misunderstanding. <laughs> we, we've had plans for emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases that go way back. In fact, we implemented them with the Zika and Ebola and pandemic flu. This is really an upgrading and an updating of the pandemic preparedness plan that has elements to it that we had discussed among ourselves and have now been as it were, completely formalized, integrated into the government-wide plan. So the NIAID, my institute that I direct, that's primarily responsible for the conduct and the funding of research in infectious diseases, of which emerging infections is a major component. We've had these kinds of plans for a while. What we're talking about now, what you've heard about, is the government-wide pandemic preparedness plan that has multiple components to it, one of which is the development of countermeasures. So actually, Dr. Fauci, I did, I did want to ask you about the details of the plan because the approach is to identify prototype pathogens and priority pathogens. What does that mean? Okay, so there, there, are, there are two issues that I think the general public needs to understand if you take a priority pathogen that means something that you have a high suspicion that might ultimately evolve into a pandemic form so you speak you pick out a very specific um uh microbe or pathogen for example like nipah virus or one of the influenzas or another Ebola or something like that. That is a priority pathogen. A prototype pathogen is much more comprehensive and broad. And that is you look at the multiple families of pathogens. For example, one of the families is coronavirus family, which is SARS, MERS, COVID-19. And what you do is that you get some common denominators in that family and you anticipate and work on them to be ready if one of the members of that family evolves into a threatening pathogen. Another one is the filoviruses, which would be, for example, Ebola. Another would be the flaviviruses, which as you know is yellow fever and West Nile fever and Zika and all the others. So when you talk about prototype pathogen is you pick out a group and the total group is about 20 of them, different families of viruses that have multiple trees, multiple, excuse me, multiple branches on the tree of this particular family. And you do fundamental basic research be it in the immunology, in the diagnostics, in the virology, in all of that together to be prepared. And, and when people don't really understand what you mean, all you need to do is to show the history of how we responded so extraordinarily successfully to the COVID-19 outbreak with a highly effective and safe group of vaccines and that's what I was going to that's what yeah, I was going to ask you that that this strategy has been used in the past and has been successful in the past. Oh, it, it's been extraordinarily successful. For example, we did multiple years of basic and clinical research on the coronaviruses that dated back, you know, prior to 2002, the coronaviruses were really a family and there were four of them 
that cause about anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of the common colds that you and I repetitively experience, usually during the winter months. So there wasn't much activity on coronaviruses. Then in 2002, which is now 20 years ago, when we had the first pandemic of SARS of coronavirus, you might remember about 8,000 people in the world got infected and about 800 died. It had about a 10% mortality. Fortunately, it did not spread efficiently enough to become a sustained pandemic. But that alerted us that we better start learning and preparing a lot more for the broad family of coronaviruses, particularly a subgroup called the beta coronaviruses in which COVID-19 and MERS falls into. So that we've been working for at least two decades on getting all of the things that you need to do to move really quickly in case you had an outbreak. And as you alluded to quite correctly, that led to a spectacular success. In you know, I wanted to ask you about, in, you know, in developing vaccines, treatments, what part of that work is done at NIH and other government institutions? And then what part is done by private companies like Moderna, Pfizer, others? Well, I when another group in there, and that's what we do here on our campus, such as in our vaccine research center, which was the major group, literally a thousand yards or a thousand feet from where I'm sitting right now, who developed the immunogens that we used in the successful COVID-19 vaccines. But about 80% of the money that's spent on research is not spent here on campus. It goes to grants and contracts to universities and medical centers throughout the country and in some respects throughout the world. So there are government scientists like myself and my lab and my team. And there are people at Harvard and Yale and San Francisco and Seattle and Cornell and places like that, that we fund. We often uh, collaborate with pharmaceutical companies. For example, when we developed together with Moderna, the mRNA vaccine that is now successfully used with COVID-19, that was a long-standing and very commonly employed collaboration with fundamental basic and clinical scientists, as well as pharmaceutical companies. So that's how that marriage occurred. But a lot of it has to do with grantees at universities. Dr. Fauci, a big part of this pandemic preparedness plan is coordination across the government with private partners and internationally. It sounds like an awful lot of coordination. How do you do that? Well, you do it by an all of government response. For example, the overall pandemic plan that you probably are alluding to is one that came out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. But the actual scientific planning came from the NIH, the CDC, the FDA, and the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. So a lot of it is focused in the Department of Health and Human Services. But when you look about pandemic preparedness, it involves more than one agency. It involves all the sub-agencies within HHS, but it also involves the Department of Defense. It involves USAID. It involves the Department of State. So it really is an all of government and it is coordinated really quite well. What about the communication plan with the American public? Is there a plan for that through your organization, NIAID? Well, we certainly have a very strong communication uh, uh, enterprise here that has a lot of experience with communicating everything from risks to an evaluation of the research findings and how they need to be interpreted. It is overall coordinated at the level of the department. Uh, so let me give you an example. The White House has a communication group that we deal with literally multiple times a week, sometimes every day. There's a communication group at HHS. 
And I have my own communication group here at NIAID, and they are talking to each other literally on a daily basis. So it really is quite quite well organized. And finally, Dr. Fauci, and I know your, your time is tight and that you've got to go, but I'm wondering what do we already have in place now, given what we've been through in the last two years, that puts us in a better place if, if there is, an, and everybody agrees that there will be another pandemic in the future? Well, we have not only the extraordinary experience of what we've been through, but we also have a number of people already working on things like a pan-coronavirus vaccine, multiplex diagnostics, discovery and development of antivirals. That's going on right now in preparation for the next outbreak. So you don't hear a lot about that because everyone is understandably and appropriately focusing on the challenge of COVID-19, but already there's an awful lot going on in preparation for what will inevitably, even though we don't know when, but inevitably we'll get another pandemic. All right, well, Dr. Fauci, appreciate you joining us and thank you very much for, for being with us. My pleasure, good to be with you.